Madam Speaker, the President of the United States. Members of Congress, I have the high privilege and distinct honor to present to you the President of the United States. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. History, presidents have come to this chamber to speak to Congress, to the nation, and to the world, to declare war, to celebrate peace, to announce new plans and possibilities. Tonight, I come to talk about crisis and opportunity, about rebuilding the nation, revitalizing our democracy, and winning the future for America. I stand here tonight, one day shy of the 100th day of my administration, 100 days since I took the oath of office and lifted my hand off our family Bible and inherited a nation we all did that was in crisis, the worst pandemic in a century, the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression, the worst attack on our democracy since the Civil War. Now. After just 100 days, I can report to the nation, America is on the move again. <laughs> Turning peril into possibility, crisis to opportunity, setbacks into strength, we all know Life can knock us down, but in America, we never, ever, ever stay down. Americans always get up. Today, that's what we're doing. America's rising anew, choosing hope over fear, truth over lies, and light over darkness. After 100 days of rescue and renewal, America is ready for a takeoff, in my view. We're working again, dreaming again discovering again, and leading the world again. We have shown each other and the world that there's no quit in America, none. The American Jobs Plan is going to create millions of good-paying jobs, jobs Americans can raise a family on, as my dad would then say, with a little breathing room. And all the investments in the American Jobs Plan will be guided by one principle, buy American. <laughs> buy American. And I might note parenthetically, that does not, that does not violate any trade agreement. It's been the law since the 30s, buy American. American tax dollars are going to be used to buy American products made in America to create American jobs. That's the way it's supposed to be and it will be in this administration.
And I made it clear to all my cabinet people, their ability to give exemptions has been strenuously limited. It will be American products. Now, I know some of you at home are wondering whether these jobs are for you. So many of you, so many of the folks I grew up with feel left behind, forgotten, in an economy that's so rapidly changing. It's frightening. I want to speak directly to you, because you think about it. That's what people are most worried about. Can I fit in? Independent experts estimate the American Jobs Plan will add millions of jobs and trillions of dollars to economic growth in the years to come. It is a it is an eight-year program. These are good-paying jobs that can't be outsourced. Nearly 90 percent of the infrastructure jobs created in the American Jobs Plan do not require a college degree. 75 percent don't require an associate's degree. The American Jobs Plan is a blue-collar blueprint to build America. That's what it is. And it recognizes something I've always said in this chamber and the other. Good guys and women on Wall Street, but Wall Street didn't build this country. The middle class built the country, and unions built the middle class. The American Rescue Plan lowered health care premiums for 9 million Americans who buy their coverage under the Affordable Care Act. I know that's really popular this side of the aisle. <laughs> but let's make that provision permanent so their premiums don't go back up. In addition to my family's plan, I'm going to work with Congress to address this year other critical priorities for American families. The Affordable Care Act has been a lifeline for millions of Americans, protecting people with pre-existing conditions, protecting women's health. And the pandemic has demonstrated how badly, how badly it's needed. Let's lower deductibles for working families on the Affordable Care and Affordable Care Act. And let's lower prescription drug costs. We know how to do this. The last president had that as an objective. We all know how outrageously expensive drugs are in America. In fact, we pay the highest prescription drug prices of anywhere in the world, right here in America. Nearly three times for the same drug, nearly three times what other countries pay. We have to change that, and we can. Let's do what we talked about for all the years I was down here in this, in this body in Congress. Let's give Medicare the power to save hundreds of billions of dollars by negotiating lower drug prescription prices. And by the way, it won't just, it won't just help people on Medicare. Lower prescription drug costs for everyone. And the money we save, which is billions of dollars, can go to strengthen the Affordable Care Act and expand Medicare coverage benefits without costing taxpayers an additional penny. It's within our power to do it. Let's do it now. We've talked about it long enough, Democrats and Republicans. Let's get it done this year. This is all about a simple premise. Health care should be a right, not a privilege in America. The climate crisis is not our fight alone. It's a global fight. The United States accounts, as all of you know, less than 15 percent of carbon emissions. The rest of the world accounts for 85 percent. That's why I kept my commitment to rejoin the Paris Accord, because if we do everything perfectly, it's not going to only matter. I kept my commitment to convene a climate summit right here in America with all the major economies of the world, China, Russia, India, European Union. And I said I'd do it in my first 100 days. I want to be very blunt about it. 
I had a, my attempt was to make sure that the world could see there was a consensus that we are at an inflection point in history. The consensus, consensus is if we act to save the planet, we can create millions of jobs and economic growth and opportunity to raise the standard of living of almost everyone around the world. If you watched any of it and you were all busy, I'm sure you didn't have much time. That's what virtually every nation said, even the ones that aren't doing their fair share. My discussions in my discussion with President Xi, I told him, we welcome the competition. We're not looking for conflict. But I made absolutely clear that we will defend America's interest across the board. America will stand up to unfair trade practices and undercut American workers and American industries like subsidies from state to state-owned operations and enterprises and the theft of American technology and intellectual property. I also told President Xi that we'll maintain a strong military presence in the Indo-Pacific just as we do with NATO and Europe not to start a conflict, but to prevent one. I told them what I've said to many world leaders, that America will not back away from our commitments, our commitment to human rights and fundamental freedoms and to our alliances. And I pointed out to him, no responsible American president could remain silent when basic human rights are being so blatantly violated. An American president, president has to represent the essence of what our country stands for. America is an idea, the most unique idea in history. We are created, all of us, equal. It's who we are. And we cannot walk away from that principle and, in fact, say, we're dealing with the American idea. You know, it's estimated that 50 women are shot and killed by an intimate partner every month in America. 50 a month. Let's pass it and save some lives. And I need to. I need not tell anyone this, but gun violence has become an epidemic in America. The flag at the White House was still flying at half-mast for the eight victims of the mass shooting in Georgia, when 10 more lives were taken in the mass shooting in Colorado. And in the week in between those two events, 250 other Americans were shot dead in the streets of America. 250 shot dead. I know how hard it is to make progress on this issue. In the 90s, we passed universal background checks, a ban on assault weapons and high-capacity magazines that hold 100 rounds that can be fired off in seconds. We beat the NRA. Mass shootings and gun violence declined. Check out the report over 10 years. But in the early 2000s, the law expired. We've seen daily bloodshed since. I'm not saying if the law continued, we wouldn't see bloodshed. More than two weeks ago in the Rose Garden, surrounded by some of the bravest people I know, the survivors and families who lost loved ones to gun violence, I laid out several of the Department of Justice a actions that are being taken to impact on this epidemic. One of them is banning so-called ghost guns. These are homemade guns built from a kit that includes directions how to finish the firearm. The parts have no serial numbers, so they show up at crime scenes and they can't be traced. The buyers of these ghost gun kits aren't required to pass any background check. Anyone from a criminal or terrorist could buy this kit and within 30 minutes have a weapon that's lethal but no more. And I'll do everything in my power to protect the American people from this epidemic of gun violence, but it's time for Congress to act as well. Yeah. Look. I don't want to be 
overcome confrontation, but we need more Senate Republicans to join the overwhelming majority of Democratic colleagues and close the loopholes required in background check purchases of guns. We need a ban on assault weapons and high-capacity magazines. And don't tell me it can't be done. We did it before, and it worked. Talk to most responsible gun owners and hunters. They'll tell you there's no possible justification for having 100 rounds in a weapon. What do you think, deer wearing Kevlar vests? I mean, what's, they'll tell you that there are too many people today who are able to buy a gun but shouldn't be able to buy a gun. These kinds of reasonable reforms have overwhelming support from the American people, including many gun owners. The country supports reform, and Congress should act. This shouldn't be a red or blue issue. And no amendment to the Constitution is absolute. You can't yell fire in a crowded theater. From the very beginning, there were certain guns, weapons, that could not be owned by Americans. Certain people could not own those weapons ever. We're not changing the Constitution. We're being reasonable. I think this is not a Democrat or Republican issue. I think it's an American issue. The struggle is far from over. The question of whether our democracy will long endure is both ancient and urgent. As old as our republic, still vital today. Can our democracy deliver on its promise that all of us, created equal in the image of God, had a chance to lead lives of dignity, respect, and possibility? Can our democracy deliver the most, to the most pressing needs of our people? Can our democracy overcome the lies, anger, hate, and fears that have pulled us apart? America's adversaries, the autocrats of the world, are betting we can't. And I promise you, they're betting we can't. They believe we're too full of anger and division and rage. They look at the images of the mob that assaulted the Capitol as proof that the sun is setting on American democracy. But they're wrong. You know it, I know it. But we have to prove them wrong. We have to prove democracy still works, that our government still works, and we can deliver for our people. In our first 100 days together, we've acted to restore people's faith in democracy to deliver. We're vaccinating the nation. We're creating hundreds of thousands of new jobs. We're delivering real results to people. They can see it, feel it in their own lives. Opening doors of opportunity, guaranteeing some more fairness and justice. That's the essence of America. That's democracy in action. Our Constitution opens with the words, as trite as it sounds, we the people. Well, it's time to remember that we the people are the government, you and I, not some force in a distant capital, not some powerful force that we have no control over. It's us. It's we the people. In another era, when our democracy was tested, Franklin Roosevelt reminded us, in America, we do our part. We all do our part. That's all I'm asking, that we do our part, all of us. That if we do that, we will meet the center challenge of the age by proving that democracy is durable and strong. Autocrats will not win the future. We will. America will. And the future belongs to America. As I stand here tonight before you in a new and vital hour of life and democracy of our nation, and I can say with absolute confidence, I have never been more confident or optimistic about America, not because I'm president, because of what's happening with the American people. We've stared into the abyss of insurrection and autocracy, pandemic and pain, and we, the people, did not flinch. The very moment our adversaries were certain we'd pull apart and fail, we came together, we united. With light and hope, we summoned a new strength, new resolve to position us to win the competition of the 21st century. On our way to a union more perfect, more prosperous, and more just, as one people, one nation, and one America. Folks, as I told every world leader I've ever met with over the years, it's never, ever, ever been a good bet to bet against America, and it still isn't.
We're the United States of America. There is not a single thing, nothing, nothing beyond our capacity. We can do whatever we set our minds to if we do it together. So let's begin to get together. God bless you all, and may God protect our troops. Thank you for your patience.